Judgment Day is the nothing personal word of the day for Monday, May 2nd, 2022. Trevor Bauer was suspended for two years by the Commissioner of Baseball, Rob Manford. The suspension was handed out this weekend, and it was announced as 324 games, which caused a lot of people to do a little math. They did the math and realized that 160 times 2 is 320, and then 2 times 2 is 4. 320 plus 4 is 324. Holy shnikes, that's two full years. Not for the 2022 and 23 season, because the 2022 season is already one month in. So it was specified the number of games. The longest ever suspension under the domestic violence joint agreement between the union and the commissioner. There is plenty to break down. I want to go through with you what's been going on. What took so long? He's been under administrative leave for almost a year. It started in July of 2021. Here we are in May of 22. No criminal charges, and that was decided a couple months ago already. So what has taken so long and why yesterday? Well, let's start with the concept of administrative leave. So there's perfect clarity. Trevor Bauer has gotten paid every two weeks since he was put on administrative leave at the exact rate of the contract he signed as a free agent with the Los Angeles Dodgers. Whether he was pitching, whether he was not pitching, whether he was in the clubhouse or whether he was home on his podcast or talking to his attorney for hire, whatever he was doing, he was getting paid. Major League Baseball players get paid from April through September. So this offseason, he didn't get paid, but nor did anyone else. But then when the season started again, March 26th, he started getting paid again at his new rate of his deal for 2022. You may recall he signed that $105 million three-year deal, that huge contract with the Dodgers as a free agent. So administrative leave is a concept under the domestic violence bill. I call it, I call it a bill, right? It was an agreement between the union and the commissioner. Protocols. The administrative leave is when there is a discovery of an event, the thought, the possibility of an act that causes the commissioner to believe that there will have to be an investigation into this player and pending the completion of that investigation, this player will not be allowed to play. However, this player may be innocent, quote unquote, and I don't mean criminally, may be innocent of violating the protocols. Therefore, the agreement was this player will still get paid until the end of administrative leave. Until the commissioner's office comes down off the mountain and says, here's what we found. The commissioner doesn't hire outside firms. There's no Coca and Sampson who are being hired. They have what's called the, a Department of Investigations, which is a large group of people who have a pretty serious amount of power. Now, you can watch a movie that Billy Corbin did about A-Rod and steroids, Biogenesis and Balco. I can't remember the one that was in Miami, not the one that was in San Francisco, not the Barry Bonds one. And you can know that the Department of Investigations is a interesting department. It does not have subpoena power, but it has access and money. When you are doing an investigation, like when you want to hire a PI, like let's say you want to hire Charlie's Angels and you have to have the money to talk to John Forsyth and get David Doyle and the crew on the case, or when you want to hire the A-team, the first thing you need is to make sure you've got the money to do it. MLB put together this department, they funded it, and they say, go do your job, tell me everything, and before you put anything in writing, we're gonna be in touch. We're gonna be in touch on a weekly basis, not all the way up to the commissioner, but to the deputy commissioner, and then up to the commissioner, not as often as that, and we're going to tell you where we are, who we're talking to, what we're finding, as we're putting together the writing, the conclusion. And we're going to work together to come up with something that you can then negotiate with the union. And in the meantime, we have seven days. Well, 
As you know, these investigations take way more than seven days, but the union wanted to make sure it was protecting its members so that the commissioner could not just sit on an investigation, put a player on administrative leave, and let him sit there forever. So after seven days, the union and MLB have to agree to extend the administrative leave. Trevor Bauer's administrative leave has been extended every seven days since last July. Sometimes they did it in bigger chunks. where They, they said, we're going to extend it by a month. But it's always with agreement. And the reason the union continued to agree to extend administrative leave is that they were very aware that there was a lot more going on in this story than what was released in the public. And what I mean by that is they were aware there were other victims who were talking to MLB who had not gone public. And they were aware they had a player who did not want to make a deal. And the reason that part is so important is every other single suspension under the domestic violence protocols has been a negotiated punishment. A negotiated punishment is one where the commissioner goes to the union and says, we've done our due diligence, we've done our investigation, here's what we found, we are suspending this player for 20 games. Are you in? The union says, what do you got? I'll show you what I have. The union goes to the player and says, sorry, 20 games. Take it, and if you don't take it, you're gonna have to go to a hearing because they're gonna give you more than 20 games. Okay, I take 20 games, I'm Marcelo Zuna, and I'm playing starting opening day because we also negotiated that I get time served. So you see there is a negotiation that goes on between the player, the union, and the commissioner over the punishment. Trevor Bauer has made it clear from day one. I did nothing wrong. You can investigate me all you want, but the only punishment I will take is restoring my name to its previous glory of being an absolute player that no one wants to play with, who's got a million dollar arm and a 10 cent head, who has trouble with one of the great men in baseball history, Terry Francona. Restore my name and punish me for zero games. Well, Trevor, you know we're going to have to give you five games. No, no, you're giving me zero. The commissioner was very aware that whatever happened in the Bauer case, there was never going to be a time where Trevor Bauer would have agreed to any punishment, even if there had been criminal charges. That's what people are missing when giving you their Bauer analysis. If Bauer had been charged criminally, he still was not going to accept an MLB suspension that would have been longer than the pendency of the criminal charges. MLB would have waited had there been criminal charges. MLB would have not kept him on administrative leave though they would have immediately suspended him because administrative leave is counting toward the Dodgers payroll. Administrative leave means that Bauer is getting paid. So once Bauer was not charged criminally, the Dodgers said to baseball, let's get this going because if you're gonna suspend him, the sooner the better. How does a team get involved with its own player? That seems like it should be against the rules, right? Because the union's petrified of that. The union wouldn't agree to a concept that I wanted desperately over the years, which was that if a player tested positive for steroids on a guaranteed contract, that player would have the guarantee portion of his contract turn into non-guaranteed money. So if you have a player with five years, $100 million left on his contract and the player tests positive for steroids like Robinson Cano, you get to eliminate that contract. You can keep the player if you want. You can get rid of the player, but no more guaranteed contract. The union said, no chance, toilet pants. Why? Because we're afraid that owners, presidents, GMs, will look at a player and say, God, do you suck? and we're gonna spike your Gatorade with steroids, you're gonna test positive, and then we get to release you and not pay you. 
I said to the union, I said to agents when I was told about that objection, I said, let me get this straight. I'm going to get my hands on steroids because a guy's hitting 185 with seven home runs who took steroids after hitting 325 with 50 home runs. I'm going to spike his punch and I'm going to just hope that everyone stays quiet. I'm going to hope that no one says a word that somehow I get my hands on steroids, maybe through 1-800, you know, bulk me, or maybe I go to my team doctor and hope that they have the Hippocratic Oath that they don't say anything. And then I'm going to figure out a way to get him to drink the exact Gatorade. I can't get a player to go to the bathroom when I want him to, but I'm going to have this player drink the special Gatorade. Or maybe I'll go to the chef and put it in a salad. I'll sprinkle the steroids on his Parmesan cheese. Come on. Anyway, the union always said, no, we're not going to do it. So the union has the mentality that play, that players are targets. I wonder in this case whether or not teams go to Major League Baseball and call Rob and say, listen, we got to get Chapman back here. We got to get Ozuna back. I mean, I'm happy to have you suspend him. That's okay, but it's a, you know we're going to need him to play. And then the Dodgers called MLB and said, you got to do us a favor here. We're happy to pay him for 2000 and." 21, but we really need the salary relief in 2022 because we don't want to go over the Steve Cohen tax line and we want to spend that money as we attempt to win the World Series again. Is there any chance that you could suspend him for the rest of his contract? Because we really, you know, he's never going to be a Dodger again. Our players don't want him. Our fans don't want him. We're embarrassed that we even signed him. And the best way we deal with embarrassment is we buy Chelsea. But just in case we can't do that, we're going to have to make sure he's never a Dodger. So whatever you find, let's talk. So Rob Manfred calls up Mark, maybe Andrew, maybe Stan, probably Stan, and says, all right, here's what we got on Trevor. Uh, We got a bunch of people. I think we can get away here with two years for the rest of his contract with you, but we're going to have a small problem here. What's that, Rob? The problem is he's going to appeal and we're going to have to have an entire hearing. And there's a risk at the hearing that the suspension could be reduced. Well, wait a minute. Can you then suspend him for four years and hope that it gets reduced to two? I love your heads at Stan, but no, we have to not suspend him for that long because we have a hard time going to a hearing to argue that. There is no basis for a four-year suspension for this. Two years will seem appropriate, firm, and disruptive to his career and will serve to end his career with you. But what happens, Rob, if the suspension gets lowered? Well, then you're just going to have to release him and pay him the balance of his contract. But you're going to have the break for at least a year. There's no way the arbitrator is going to get this below a year, below 162 games. So you can feel free in 2022 to spend his salary. Well, wait, should we wait for the hearing? How quickly the hearing is the hearing going to happen? It's not going to be quick. It's going to be months, not weeks. And then it's going to take time for a decision. Well, couldn't we ask for a quick decision? Don't you think Trevor Bauer is going to ask for an immediate adjudic- adjudication? I almost said adjudication. Side note, detour, I was thinking about rest rest in peace, Naomi Judd. What a tragic end to her very accomplished life. And I was just reading about it before the show. So I said adjudication. Strange, it's adjudication. Everything with the Bauer case is going to take time. Everything with the Bauer case has happened exactly as we told you it was going to happen in the exact manner we told you it was going to happen. We had wait to seize going all the way back to July by the way, on this. When it first happened on July 1st, we said he must be suspended. Yeah, he was. That's a yes. Two weeks later, we said, you know, the administrative leave that you're all worried about ending every week? Don't worry. The administrative leave is going to keep going until he's suspended. Under a year later, that's what happened. On July 15th, we had you covered of last year. That's a yes. On August 2nd, we said Bauer is never going to wear a Dodger uniform again. I'm taking the yes for that. We're going to revisit that, Coca, if just by chance he wears that Dodger uniform again. And by the way, an alumni game doesn't count, but he will never be invited to alumni games. It is a sure thing. I'm taking the win. Trevor Bauer's career with the Dodgers is done. So Trevor Bauer gets called by baseball and the union, told about what's going to happen. 
and everyone is prepared and they get time to formulate their statement. You saw that MLB and the Dodgers released simultaneous statements. All of them as boring as you'd expect when you know there's going to be an appeal and a hearing. MLB just said very simply, Commissioner Rob Manfred announced today that following an extensive invest investigation, Trevor Bauer has received a suspension for 324 championship season games without pay, effective today for violating Major League Baseball's joint domestic violence, sexual assault, and child abuse policy. That's the thing I was saying at the beginning of the show. I called it the domestic violence protocol. It's called the joint domestic violence, sexual assault, child abuse policy. Just there you go. Commissioner's office will not issue any further statements at this point. The Dodgers, by the way, we're told when teams have players who are suspended for steroids or are suspended under this agreement, under the joint agreement, the domestic violence protocol, we're told that in our release, in our statement, we have to say what the Dodgers said. The Dodgers organization takes all the allegations of this nature very seriously and does not condone or excuse any acts of domestic violence or sexual assault. Take a look at every team statement following a guy getting banged for steroids. The blank team, insert name, takes all violations of the substance abuse or all violations of don't take steroids very seriously or all allegations of this nature. Everybody takes everything so seriously. Thank you. That's the Dodger statement. Bauer, he doubled down. And this is where it gets interesting when this goes to hearing. Bauer said in the strongest possible terms, I deny committing any violation of the MLB domestic violence and sexual assault policy. I'm appealing this action and expect to prevail. As we have throughout this process, my reps and I respect the confidentiality of the proceedings. Meanwhile, Trevor Bauer is suing the Atlantic. He's suing companies who have tried to defame him in his mind. We talked about that in a previous episode. Meanwhile, Meanwhile, he was very clear to tell you he didn't violate the policy. He certainly didn't put in his statement that he didn't violate women. He said he didn't violate the policy. So now his attorney for hire, Rachel Luba, is going to start preparing for what will be a full trial with witnesses, with testimony, under oath, where there will be a hearing a hearing that baseball never wanted to happen because they've never had to do it before. A hearing which Trevor Bauer has always wanted to happen, which is why settlement could not be reached. The question for MLB will be whether any women will come forward and be willing to testify or will it only be based on interviews that took place between MLB and these women? Will MLB presenting findings of fact through their own investigation or findings of fact through the mouths of witnesses. Testimony that can either be judged credible or not credible. Witnesses who would then be subject to cross-examination by Bowers attorneys for hire. How do you decide if you're a woman that you wanna be a part of this? You don't get subpoenaed, you have to volunteer to do it. These arbitrators don't have subpoena power. If you are one of the women who's been violated by Trevor Bauer, are you coming forward? Do you care that he's suspended for 324 games or 162 games or 80 games or 40 games? Or do you care that Trevor Bauer is not taking responsibility for his actions, hard stop, period, and there's nothing they can do about it? No matter what the arbitrator finds, Trevor Bauer will never acknowledge that he did anything that these women did not want him to do or had not agreed before it started that was going to happen. No matter what happens, Trevor Bauer is going to die on this hill forever. If you are a victim of Trevor Bauer's, and you know that. If you're a victim of Trevor Bauer's, and you know that there's no chance for any sort of, not just reconciliation, but acknowledgement, what do you do? Do you help MLB? Do you help them more than just interviewing with the DOI? Do you help them by being a part of the hearing? If I'm re representing these women, I'm having a hard time making that decision for them. 
I'm going to give him the positives and the negatives. I'm going to say to have your day in court, quote unquote, to be able to face him and tell him that what he did was wrong and hope to God that there's one other man out there listening. So there's one woman out there who will be protected and not have to go through what you went through. I'd have to think about it. Pay attention to what next steps are as we look at the back and forth with Bauer and when the hearings will be. For my purposes on nothing personal, I'm not closing the book on Trevor Bauer, but we have covered this from the beginning. The hearing will be interesting and we'll discuss it, but in the meantime, I don't want to give him one more ounce of my oxygen. There has never been a less deserving player to receive any amount of segments on nothing personal. And to all of the women, on behalf of men who don't treat women like garbage, who don't assault women, I'm sorry. Wait to see is when we tell you something's going to happen. When it happens, we revisit it. When it doesn't happen, we revisit it. We wanted to give you a show. For those of you new to Nothing Personal, we looked at the April numbers. There are a lot of you, so thank you. We wanted to give you a show that's a little different than what you get everywhere else, where people just give you hot take after hot take and hope you don't listen, hope you think that we forget or that you forget or that I think that you're going to forget even though I'll remember. But the fact of the matter is you shouldn't remember because I'm always going to remind you just in case you do. On December 14th of 2021, for those going to back episodes, which there are a lot of you doing that, which is totally cool, we said Zion Williamson will not play in one game this season for the Pelicans. Zion Williamson on the sideline as the Pelicans got eliminated by the Suns. It made me insane. Zion Williamson doing dunks during practice and all the exciting stuff he did and all of the released videos getting all these thousands of hits and views. Zion Williamson is an absolute nothing for the Pelicans. We said he wouldn't play. He didn't. We got it right. Do you remember the story that we talked about on January 18th of 2022 when there was a organization who are agents for Major League Baseball players who went out, I'm talking about Endeavor, and bought a bunch of minor league teams and the agents union said, hmm, the union said, we may decertify these people. I think there's a conflict of interest to be an owner and an agent. And I said, no, they're not going to be decertified by the union. Guess what? They weren't. We got that right. February 17th, I told you Kyrie would play at home in the playoffs. He did. We got it right. How about the Nets? Can I just take one second on that, Coca? A little off the schedule. The Nets are supposed to be this superpower, right? They have Harden. They have Durant. They have Irving. Then Irving turns out to be the most selfish player in basketball. Harden turns out to be the second most, which is amazing because they're sort of tied for first. Durant is stuck dealing in this playpen of infants, in this world of ego maniacism. But the Nets were still, for whatever reason, thought to be this great team. And the Celtics crushed them swept them. Wow, the Celtics, the number one offensive team, the number one defensive team since they turned their season around. These guys are great. Did you know what our pick was this weekend? Spoiler alert, we had the Bucks. What about on March 3rd, 2022? Go back and listen to that show. We were talking about Deshaun Watson saying he won't play for the Texans in 22. Got that right. Traded. As the season was starting, Spring training started in MLB on March 4th. We told you, hey, COVID's still around, which it is, but there aren't going to be any more COVID protocols in MLB. They're tired of it. I knew that. That's a yes. No more COVID protocols. Then when the CBA was announced, we said, remember when there was that big fight when the CBA in baseball was about to be announced, but there was a fight about the international draft and the owners wanted it, but the players didn't and the players were not going to accept an international draft. And the owners said, there's no CBA without an international draft. And I told all of you to keep calm and carry on. There's not going to be an international draft, but there will be an agreement. Bingo. March 10th, no international draft. Yes. <sighs> oh, I missed a Bauer wait to see on April 19th of 2022. Just a week ago, two weeks ago. I told you that Bauer would be suspended between 120 and 200 games, which would have been the largest suspension ever. 
Got that wrong and ended up being 324. Coco, what do I get on the way to see if the arbitrator reduces his suspension to between 120 and 200? Just out of curiosity, do I get to revisit that? Is there a chance that gets to be right again? Coco's Googling. All right, today's wait to see. Book it. Get ready. Please tell me you watched John Morant and the Memphis Grizzlies. God, is he good. Sorry, New Orleans, but he's better than Zion. But there's something about the Warriors. There's something about the Warriors. They lose Draymond Green to an injection on a flagrant two, which was not a flagrant two, not close to a flagrant two. It was a flagrant one. The referee thought that he was pulling him to the ground by grabbing his jersey, GMAB. Draymond Green ejected in the second quarter. The game's in Memphis. Crowd going crazy. Draymond Green is the glue of their team. Does he remind anyone else of Dennis Rodman? You can't stand playing against him, but you love him when he's on your team. I think Draymond Green may even be better than Dennis Rodman. All of that said, not only are the Warriors going to beat the Grizzlies, having one game, one at home, I'm not saying something that is so epic. The Golden State Warriors are going to the NBA Finals. Take a look at that team. Show me a hole. Show me one hole that team has. Warriors will win the Western Conference. Wait to see. When we come back, we're going to review Ozark and we're going to talk about what's going on with the Philadelphia 76ers who start their series tonight, Monday, May 2nd, against the Miami Heat. Please stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Nothing Personal. Thank you very much. Here's your job. Our job is to be with you 45 minutes a day. Your job is to rate, review, follow us on Twitter, David P. Sampson, Instagram, David P. Sampson, TikTok. I think we're on TikTok, Coke. I can't remember. I don't even know what the TikTok thing is. Just, I don't know. Review on Apple. We need those ratings and reviews and follows. Go to Nothing Personal with David Sampson on YouTube. I am sending out a prize. We did get that winner. The fact that I wore the same outfit two days in a row last week. It's a guy from Virginia, I believe. It's being taken care of. Okay, we watch a movie every single day. We watch TV, something, a series. Ozark was released the last seven episodes of the last season. They did something that made me insane until Friday, and then it made me happy. They announced that season four will be the last year of the Jason Bateman-led Netflix series. But they announced they're going to release it almost like two seasons. They're going to release seven episodes at once months ago, and then the last seven on April 29th. So, of course, I woke up Friday, did a show, and I was watching Ozark. I had some stuff I had to do this weekend. Had an interesting weekend in Washington, D.C. It was the White House Correspondents' Dinner this weekend. I was not at the dinner, but I was at a... UTA party on Friday night in DC. UTA is the agency that I work with. Yes, hello, Jerry. Do your job. And sitting there in a party and meeting people and talking to people, all of whom are represented by UTA. So you're seeing people from CNN, people from Fox. You're seeing people like a Pat Sajak. Just it's an interesting room full of people. You're eating food, you're drinking, doing all sorts of fun stuff. Just being around smart people makes me happy. Being around smart, beautiful people who are interested not just in our country, but interested in having conversations that are intellectual in nature, that make you think it's never good to be the smartest person in the room all the time. It's really important every once in a while to make sure you are with intellectually superior people because that's how you learn. It's the same in sports, isn't it? If you always play tennis against people worse than you or ping pong against people who are worse than you, do you ever get better? You only get better through failure. You only get better through losing. The winning comes from learning how to lose and improving your game. But I did get all of Ozark in and I got to talk about it. The episodes in season four, the last seven, it's about a family who are normal, and I say that with all intention. A normal family, they're accountants, they've got kids, 2.4 kids, 1.2 dogs, a husband and a wife who are happy at least 69% of the time. Then all of a sudden, there's a realization that in fact, the husband, unbeknownst to him, 
was doing some accounting for a cartel. Well, let's just fast forward to the part where the husband had to continue working for a cartel. The husband ends up becoming part of a cartel. Basically, it's almost like Breaking Bad in a way. But the series never lost its focus, nor did Breaking Bad, which is one of my favorite series. The character development in Ozark is second to none. Julia Garner has won many awards playing one of the great TV characters of all time, Ruth Langmore. Please, if you've never watched Ozark, start now. If you have not watched the last seven episodes, I'm not going to spoil it for you except to say at the end, we discover that above all, it's family. And then you're supposed to think to yourself, is it like soprano type family? Like mafia family? Cartel family? All these movies like the Tom Clancy movies we see with Matt Damon, we see how tight knit families are when the grandfather is the drug dealer. They're always having parties. You always see it like in Blow with Johnny Depp, right? The drug dealers in Mexico, wherever they are, they're always having family gatherings and barbecues and kids are running around like having this great life. Meanwhile, there's guns everywhere, machine guns. And meanwhile, there's drugs everywhere, but the kids are happy. I always found that to be funny. Like, why is that in every movie and story? Are we supposed to believe it? I guess we are. Maybe we're every day surrounded by kids who are in the playground and we don't realize that those parents are drug dealers. Hmm. Fascinating. So, at the end of Ozark, you discover that the Bird family, every time they said Bird family, I spent the entire series thinking about Robin Bird. But that's not one of the characters' names because they never would have done that because they're of the age where they would say, ooh, we're not going to name someone Robin. But the character names, Marty, that was Jason Bateman. At the end, family wins. So the question I have as you're watching it that I had and I'd like you to ask yourself, does family always win? Or are sometimes selfish choices made which hurt the family but help the person? Or hurt the family and help another family? Do you ever not choose your family? Hmm. When it's the one thing that you didn't choose to begin with? Fascinates me. The family loyalty and drug cartels? Fascinating. Ozark season four, part two. Get to the end and then mourn the end of the series the way I did. It's a shorter mourning period than I had for West Wing, for Breaking Bad. Even shorter than the newsroom, believe it or not but it was longer, shorter than Schitt's Creek, but longer than just about every other series. It's not that I'm over it, but I'm thinking about the next thing today. Okay, tonight we've got a very interesting pick of the day. Nothing personal pick of the day. It's the Heat and Sixers. The Heat are seven and a half point favorites over the Sixers, which seems pretty heavy. Although the Heat are the number one seed. Hmm, why is that? I mean, the Heat have Harden, they have... Joel Embiid, they have Curry, they have, oh, wait a minute. Embiid, the potential MVP or certainly top two, is not playing in Miami tonight or on Wednesday. Joel Embiid got hurt at the end of the Toronto Raptors game six where the Sixers prevailed and won the series. He got hit in the face and has a right orbital fracture, which just means that all the times in the old NBA, do you remember when there were guys who wore masks? Kareem Abdul-Jabbar wore a mask. James Worthy wore a mask. Rip Hamilton wore a mask. It's either a broken nose or a broken orbital, something where you don't want to get hit in the face again, but you probably could play. You just have to wear the mask that makes you look like Phantom of the Opera. Well, Ambit also got hit in the head and, and is in the concussion protocol. And when you're in the concussion protocol, you cannot come back until you go through 10 different steps. So Embiid did not even fly to Miami, will not play in the first two, may play in game three of this series. And if so, I assure you, not a wait to see because I'm not even going to bother. It's too easy. He will be wearing a mask. Some players find that uncomfortable, but they've really changed the technology. So it's not like the Jason mask from Halloween. It's a really cool mask. What the hell was Embiid doing in the game when the Sixers were up 30 points? Can someone tell me that? I have spent so much time arguing with my managers and my general managers about pitchers and when they're taken out of a game or players when you take them out of a game in a baseball game. 
And in baseball, it's way worse than basketball because when you take a player out of a game in baseball, they can't come back. When you take a player out of a game in basketball, they can come back. So in basketball, it is even more astonishing to me, shocking that the best players are not taken out faster in blowout games because if by chance a 30-point lead becomes 10, put the guy back in the game. But if your bullpen screws it up, you can't put your starter back or you can't get that great bat in the lineup if all of a sudden you need a base hit because they tie the game on an eight-run home run, which, by the way, is hard to do. It's as hard to hit an eight-run home run as it is to hit a 24-point basket. Now, with the way MLB is, everyone's a home run. Everyone's in scoring position in the batter's box. The way the NBA is, every time down the floor is a chance to get three points. Runs of 12-0, 16-2 are common. They're going to happen. So how do you know when to pull your player? Doc Rivers was asked this very question after the game when his best player, his MVP, was ruled hurt and out. And people were calling for his coaching head. Doc Rivers, the same one who was trying to tell us that if we blow our 3 nothing lead, it's not my fault because my team in Orlando sucked. Remember that? Well, he didn't blow the lead to the Raptors. They won the series. So Doc Rivers was taking a victory lap, and then his worst nightmare happened. Embiid got hurt, and his coaching got questioned. If I am David Blitzer or Josh Harris, the owner of the Sixers, I don't know how I'm keeping Doc Rivers. If the Sixers lose to the Heat, which they will, I don't know how to keep him. Now, you're right. I had to wait to see that if the Sixers don't make the conference finals, he's going to get fired anyway. And that's before Embiid got hurt. Now I could say with him hurt that Doc Rivers would get a pass by owners because owners do think that way. Hey, we didn't have our full team. But we don't have your full team because of an injury that happens that is not to be expected or planned for. A twisted ankle, a slip when you're going in for a layup and your knee splits in two. Elbowed in the head, concussion, out. All of those things happen, and I was always okay with all of those things happening. If they were part of the game, when the outcome had not been decided. When a player of ours got hurt in a game that he should not have been in, I was disconsolate. With three minutes left and a 30-point lead, you do not need your stars in the game. There's too much risk, and there is zero reward. Doc Rivers met the media and said, look at the other team. The Raptors had their starters in. You're goddamn right they did, Doc. They were about to get eliminated. Look at all the other teams, Doc said. They all pull their stars at around the same time because of the nature of the game and the runs that take place. Eh. Totally unacceptable. You have to know that when you're dealing with big men, when you're dealing with pitchers who throw 98, big men are made of bodies that look really good, but they're pretty brittle because stuff happens. Hamstrings, calves, obliques, pectoral muscles, all those little things that when you look at someone in a jersey, you say, wow, it's a good looking guy. Wow, that guy must work out. Every one of those players, every president and every GM spends every day worrying about them getting hurt. So we'll go to our manager before a game and we'll talk about different players and we'll talk about different scenarios and whether or not we'd want a player to be pinch hit for it in a certain scenario, whether or not we want a pitcher to be taken out with a certain lead with a certain number of pitches. Basketball is a little more difficult because you're dealing with a game where the decisions not only are not permanent, but the flow of the basketball game really is much different. You can watch momentum changing in a basketball game much easier than you can in a baseball game. We all feel momentum watching baseball. We all get concerned, God, we're going to lose this game. God, if we don't score here and don't build on our lead, it's going to come back to haunt us. But then you get a double play grounder that's six inches to the left is a two-run single. Six inches to the right is a double play grounder. And then we say in basketball, one inch to the left, it doesn't swish. One inch to the right, it's a swish. That's how runs are made. 
But still, the NBA has momentum that is far easier to watch unravel. So if you are the Sixers or you are running any team that has any big guy, you've got to be more cautious. Period. There's no excuse for what Doc Rivers did. And it's going to cost them. We're going with the heat over the Sixers tonight by seven and a half. Okay. You know, I I put something on Twitter yesterday that I got a lot of people calling me offline, like texting me about. If the Heat beat the Sixers without Joel Embiid, does that make it less impactful that they beat him? I'm just throwing that out there. Well, as someone who ran a team, I can tell you, we didn't give one crap whether there was a pitcher hurt, whether we missed a pitcher during the course of a three-game series, or whether the other side was missing their best hitter, or their best hitter went one for 18 during the series, or whether their best pitcher got shelled. We did not care a lick. We cared about winning a series. That was it. Because at the end of the day, what's remembered? Who wins? Not why. You think as a fan, I don't remember that Patrick Ewing didn't play in 1999 against the San Antonio Spurs in the NBA Finals? Of course I do. Do you think the San Antonio Spurs and Greg Popovich spend their time saying, oh, that title in 99? Oh, we didn't deserve that title. Or what about the Houston Rockets? Do they say, hey, Jordan was out of the league. Our, our title in 94, 95, that really doesn't count. No. Give me a break. Stop it. All the people out there yelling, just stop yelling. If the Heat win over a team that has no players, the Heat still win. By the way, Heat in six. Okay, we did went two and one this weekend. Pretty good. Friday, we told you the T-Wolves would beat the Grizzlies. There'd be a game seven. I don't know if you watched that game. But there clearly was not a game seven because there was a game one against the Warriors this weekend. God, John Morant went into Minnesota and right in front of A-Rod and right on top of one of the 10,000 lakes just showed he is a superstar. We lost that one. We told you to take the Giants and Logan Webb on Saturday. Pretty easy, right? The Nats are just bad. Logan Webb is good. That put us to one and one and brought us to Sunday's game. How come you don't believe me when I told you the Bucks plus four and a half over the Celtics was going to be a winner? And the line moved to even more. The Bucks were getting five by tip off, I think. The mentality of a team like the Celtics who comes off a sweep of the Nets, you don't allow yourself to believe that the Nets were a dysfunctional team. You don't allow yourself to believe that the Nets were a bad team. You tell yourself, wow, we kicked their bums. We are that good. Then the Celtics get on the court against the Bucs in the beginning of the game. They're up by eight, and they're thinking, hey, we don't have a letdown. Hey, we can win with Tatum and Brown not performing. We've got this. We could sweep these Bucs. Hey, we could run the table. Then all of a sudden, the Bucs started hitting some shots. They realized the Bucs have more weapons than the Nets. They realized the Bucs actually play defense, and they said, ruh row. The Bucs dominated the Celtics. Now, they can say they were let down. They can say they didn't have the right energy after sweeping Durant and the Simmons-less Bucs, Nets, excuse me, 4-6-9. They can say that the Nets didn't have the right energy without Simmons. But guess what? The Bucs are so far better than the Nets that if the Celtics don't realize that, they're going to get swept. Do you remember our wait to see at the end of last NBA season, by the way, in case you forgot? I don't even remember the date. But we said the Bucs are going to win back-to-back NBA titles. And we said it like before the offseason even started, I think. Maybe it was right before the NBA season started. I had not thought that Chris Middleton, their second best player, would get hurt. But I also had not thought that Grayson Allen would be Steve Kerr. It's going to be a fascinating series, but we had the Bucks plus four and a half, and we won. So we are 55 and 42. Don't forget that the Heat are seven and a half over the Sixers. That's it for today. We'll be back tomorrow because guess what? Tomorrow ends with a Y as well. It's just business. This is nothing personal. 